fish we get, we have to put one of these tags on and lock it. There's probably $500,000 worth of fish right there, and then a few tags. <coughs> like, and we'll catch it in seven days fishing. It's like everything else. Some people are just playing better at catching fish than others. He don't belong to no association. He don't abide by no rules. He does what he wants to do. When he wants to do it, who cares? So this year we designed a Pioneer Award and it goes to none other than Louis Hinneberg. For me, this all started with a video I made about Louis Hinneberg. An amazing guy who did things his way and succeeded in the eyes of the world. <laughs> anyway, what he said's the truth. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Lou. Louis and his sons have been steadily building a company called Ivy Fisheries. 1998 was a very good year, so they put on this Christmas party for over 200 friends, relatives, and business associates. Not exactly the hard luck image of fishing you get in the news. Louis' son Wes is now the driving force behind the business. Last fall, he caught $295,000 worth of bluefin tuna in just one day. Wes's brother Marty also has a big reputation. He and Wes alternate as skippers on the seven girls. My honey. Marty and Sherry just had a baby. And Marty jokes about fishing by saying that with six kids to feed, he's got to succeed. But how is it this family prospers when so many fishermen are in trouble? I ask Wes. He smiles, shrugs his shoulders, invites me to go out and see for myself. I'll admit I'm a bit anxious as we head out the harbor for the fishing grounds. The North Atlantic in winter is one of the stormiest seas in the world. As we leave our home port of Sambro, Nova Scotia, I realize I won't be seeing land again for eight days or more. 40 to 50 southeast, outlook southeast 30, so. At least I'm in good hands. Marty is skipper. The past 20 years, he's spent more time at sea 
than on land. Life on the Seven Girls is a kind of voluntary exile. Even the boat's name, a commemoration of seven daughters by the previous owner, is a reminder of family and friends left ashore. The fate of many people is linked to the Seven Girls. The crew works for a share of the catch, so no fish, no pay. There's Billy Gilkey, married, two children, the oldest 15, the youngest five months. Greg Smith, divorced, supports two sons and a daughter. Mark Horn and his wife are expecting their first baby. Paul Parnell is married, one daughter, and he's hoping for more kids. The other year there I was going for uh, 52 days. We were sword fishing over Newfoundland. That was too long. Too long. A two-year-old daughter home didn't get to see her for 52 days. It's kind of hard to talk your wife into having another, another child when she got raised herself, raised the children herself, right? So I'm not there a whole lot. That's the hardest day of all, leaving the harbor, get going back out again. And especially, the longer you're home, the harder it is. You get a trip off, we get our trip off on that day to go out again. Seems like you don't want to go because you talk yourself out of it. I mean, you hear these guys going around saying, oh, you're not going to get nothing, you're a waste of time, you're going to go through bad weather. Jeez, you know, you're never going to make it in if you get in a storm. Oh, that's a, I, I hate to hear that. <laughs> I don't even think that when I go out. Next morning, we're on the fishing grounds. The first string of gear is out. The next is about to go. Uh, we gotta go. Uh, I'm just thinking here, 140. 140. All right, old boy, drop your in there, Skiba. We're after a flatfish called a halibut. It grows to 300 pounds, and the crew tells me I'll see a few big ones come aboard. Every day we'll run out 12 to 15 miles of trawl, over 7,000 hooks, that goes to bottom 150 to 300 fathoms below. A fathom is six feet, so that's a long way down. You could be a half a mile from them and miss them, right? One string could have like 50, 60 haul of it, another string could have three or four right alongside of it. That's how uh, touchy they are, right? You can get a day, you might get three, four thousand pounds, and you get a day, you might get three or four hundred pounds. That's the way it is. But if you can average show like a thousand, twelve hundred pounds a day, you're going ahead, you're making, you're, getting, you're making money, right? The closest to where we are would probably be Lewisburg, probably 140 mile. We're on the edge of the, they call it the Hell's Kitchen. It's a deep water spot here where it runs in the inside part of the gully here on the chart. Fishing right along this point here from like uh, 180 to 250 fathom, set north and south. So we're really not that far from Sable Island, really. Or oh, these swindle push you right up on the bar, right? You have to be careful when you're working around. When you get up in the shoal water, the breakers start getting bigger and the seas get bigger and you'll know it. There's been some close calls around there, and a lot of boats lost in on that bar. One boat lost near Sable Island was a sister ship to the seven girls, same size and design, called the Andrea Gale. She and her crew went down without a trace during a so-called perfect storm a few years back. We start five, set at 5.30, well, we just got our gear, it's 8. We'll get something to eat, lay down for a half hour, an hour, start hauling 9, and we'll probably be hauling right till 9 tonight again. You're getting about 7 hours sleep a night, maybe 6 or 7 hours. 
Sometimes you might have a hard day, you know, you get her back till midnight, one o'clock. We've had that a few times. A couple of times we've never even gotten our bunks. Be like a zombie the next day walking around. After a few days, I realized that fishermen's work is mostly routine. Long days of setting up gear and hauling it back again, always with an eye on the weather. On average, about one hook in 200 will catch a hell of it, but you really never know where, when, or how many. carpenter work but uh, one of my friends was fishing he'd come in he'd have three 2,500 3,000 licks of that for two weeks work so I said well I got to try that so I went on one summer for a uh, half share of sword fishing and I liked it I didn't get seasick too bad so let's so try it at winter fishing so we tried that and my first trip I went on full share we were gone eight days and made two thousand dollars in eight days I thought this is it this is for me This one halibut could be worth up to a thousand dollars. I'm gonna make you feel better, right? Hug you and put a warm blanket on you. Yeah, I miss you, honey. Okay, honey, good night. Bye bye. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye bye. The baby's been sick ever since I left. He's got some kind of a stomach virus, and she caught it from him, and she can't move. She's been laying in bed all weekend. That's a bummer. I mean, within three or four hours, you can go from, like, calm winds right up to, you know, 40, 50 knot of wind, just snap of your fingers. It's just unreal. That's more or less what happened here today. Like, first string we started to haul, we had, like, 15 knots, and the next string, 30 knot, and three, four hours, it's storm force here. Mother Nature's mad at us. We got a storm brewing up up there. Marty has a younger brother fishing not far from us on a smaller boat, so the storm's rougher on his crew. From what I can make out in the radio, they're really rocking and rolling. Yeah, you make it out now. Well, <laughs> that was a nice one. Filled right full up there. <laughs> Whoa. 
stop. Yeah, we'll give you a shout. Like I said, we'll get the next spring back. All the best. Steady out, boat. Steady out. Steady as she goes, boat. My brother was lost at sea. Down here in the gully somewhere where we were fishing. And I guess if you're going to die, you're going to die, no matter where you're at. Just hope it goes fast. There is the wave there that could come and smash the windows out. I would say it's so much fear, it's a respect more than anything. You could smash the windows out and things could get really bad. I can really recall, hit her fair on the corner of the wheelhouse. And it must have been a million gallons of water because it's covered her right over when it hit her. It picked her right up. And I was in my bunk, I remember yet, I was one trying to lay down on my bunk. And I rolled right up the wall. And she went right on her side, buried the whole starboard side of the boat in. And when she come back, we didn't know if she got upset or come back. She just laid there. She come back. <laughs> that one sea comes out of nowhere and wham up. It was getting so rough, I could barely stand up. Amazing how the crew works under such conditions. I was braced against the rail my back to the seas. I didn't even know what hit me. I was thrown 10 feet across the deck. Salt water leaked into the camera and destroyed it in a minute. A big wave out of nowhere. Whammo. The dismal end of my first voyage on the Seven Girls. to me like the gold sorcerer's nuts. Well, the fever's here now, see, like, remembering all the big fish from last year. We're going to catch them again this year. No, we're going to catch more. You're going to catch more? Woo! Yeah. That's... All right, we'll see. Bet you this year's going to be better than last year. Wes is skipper on my next trip aboard the Seven Girls. But we aren't going anywhere until a stack of paperwork is in order. Wes's cousin Andy takes care of this. He started out as a fisherman, but a motorcycle accident paralyzed him from the waist down. Have the experimental license go right. Uh, when you get a ticket to the Smith & Whiteway, if you can just have transfer directly right to the seven girls. Yeah. Wes is separated from his wife. His two teenage sons live with him. The house is also a hangout for the local kids. And harpoon long line and shark. The company office is also here. Wes's sister Cindy takes care of day-to-day -day business. That's all the licenses, right? If a woman goes with a fisherman, you gotta have a very special woman. Yeah, I mean they're not they're not in that much. I mean the woman is left raising the kids. She has to be father and mother both. Because I mean when these these guys go fishing, I mean they're not an inshore fisherman. They're not out. They're not in. I mean, sometimes they're gone. It's like I said, up to 15, 16 days. And then when they do come in, they're only in, well, maybe two or three days. That's the most. Then they're out again. Marty is starting a new family in a new house he had built the previous year. His first marriage also ended in separation, then divorce. I mean, when I go to sea, my mind's totally on my work. I might 
I might lapse when I have a little bit of free time to think about home, think about the kids, think about my woman. And when I think about that, I get homesick. So I try not to dwell on that. I get, I get myself occupied with what I'm doing. And the only time I think about that when I'm on my way in. And I want to be happy when I'm home. I want to spend the time with my family. It's like two different worlds. The women don't see it that way. The women say, oh, he's spending all his time at sea. They don't, you know, it, it ain't that at all. No. It's just what, it's my occupation. And they have to respect what I do. And they got people telling them. Like the so-called friends say, well, I don't know how you can stand being with a man that's gone all the time or, or doing this and doing that. I don't know how you handle the four kids. La, 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 he's never around for you. Blah. That's the kind of stuff these people say to them. And they start believing it. Yeah. That's two years old. Okay. I'll be with a different crew this time, except for Paul Parnell. He warns me it's going to be a long trip. Fit. We depart in company with two other boats operated by Ivy Fisheries. Some people think Wes is crazy going after tuna and swordfish in early May. We're going to come south of Sable Island in a right straight course, straight down for the tail of the Grand Banks, right down to the Newfoundland Seamounts right here. We'll be almost in the middle of the North Atlantic. It's a big gamble steaming the seven girls a thousand miles to the east. In the past, there was cod and other ground fish closer to home. But now that quota is too small to make it worth catching. We're looking for uh, 65 to 70 degrees water temperature. It could be a hit or miss, right? It's about a month too early. But we got nothing else to do, so we may as well go down and try it. If we do get some swordfish and tuna, we should get a good price, because early in the season there's none around, right? The crew has four days to kill before we reach the fishing grounds. There's Jody Malloy, 26, full-time fisherman since he was 15. Brian Feener, 23, has been at it since finishing high school. Wes's son, Reagan, and Byron Nagel are both 15, both just starting out this year. Claude Rideout is a newcomer. It's only his second trip. He's the reigning champ at Cribbage. Don't get cocky. Twelve. Eighteen. Twenty-four. Twenty-six. Thirty-one. Jesus. And I got the last goal from the game on. Woohoo! Ah! One hole. I don't even want to talk. We're good playing I'm with you. I'm going to my goddamn room. I ain't coming out either. We're good pounding you. I'm not coming out. Fuel, bait, ice, groceries. To run this boat, I'd say you're talking for this trip about $30,000 before it leaves the wharf. So we have to catch $30,000 just to clear our expenses. So, in the first of the year, as a rule for us, the last five to ten years has always been bad trips, right? And it's a little harder to get the crews to go, but you have to be there at the bad times as well as the good. upside down about as high as she would up upright.
We found out later this sailboat was abandoned a month before during a big storm. The seas were running 30 feet when the crew was lifted off by a Coast Guard helicopter. The fourth day, and the water is warming up. We're on the edge of the Gulf Stream now. We got 36 miles since we warmed up. 34 mile, really. Over. Awful flat since we warmed it up. Oh, it's all 63.2 right here. 63, 63.2. We're going to try set. See what comes out of it tomorrow and we'll make a decision. We go east, west, north or south. The headline spins off the drum like a giant fishing reel. Hooks are clipped onto the headline as it goes out the stern. Every four hooks, a float is attached to keep the headline near the surface where the fish feed. In all, we'll set out 50 miles of headline strung with about 1,500 hooks that drifts free with wind and current, unanchored to the bottom. The gear can be hard to find, so a high flyer is attached to the headline every two miles. It shows up on radar, unless it's raining or storming. There's also a beeper buoy attached every five miles, a radio beacon that signals its location under all weather conditions. We've got one boat setting off to the south, one boat setting to the north, and we're setting down to the southeast, east-southeast. So. Like if somebody finds an edge of water, maybe we might be able to buddy up tomorrow, right? An edge would be if we're going along here at 63.7 and it jumps up to 69.5, that's an edge of water. We would try to follow that edge of water some which way. If we run right here on this temperature we're setting, it don't look good. Really no edge to the water here. You could get eight or ten fish on one section, but you might get any off all of it. You don't know until you haul back. The light sticks are supposed to attract small fish, which in turn attract big fish. I think this is a crazy man set, what we just set out, but... All right, I'll give you a shout, we get the light boy on it. Yeah, we will, yeah, we'll be going off the bow. Right, front of the You on there, divers? Them to watch that. I told you to watch that. Jesus Christ. Stu Friggin' stupidity is all that was. I think the crew's a bit rusty. The headline ran right off the drum. Now it's just drifting about in the dark with $120,000 worth of gear attached. Well, John, we got our out for the first day. Do you think we'll get a swordfish on it? <laughs> look at me. I'm ready. I'm twice the age as them look. I'm chipper and look at them. Young punks. One end of the gear is retrieved, and the headline is tied back on to the drum. That's the first knot of the day. It's 
It's a beautiful day in your neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in your neighborhood. Shoot me, my neighbor. Peter Rock! As the headline comes back in, so do the hooks. Mostly empty. The angle and tension on the headline as it breaks the surface can tell you something's coming. We've got half our hooks back before we finally see a swordfish. As the day wears on, the weather gets steadily worse. Overnight, a ship must have crossed our headline, cut it off. The gear is miles away by now, pushed by the rising wind and waves. The signal from a beeper buoy points us in the right direction, but it's difficult to spot anything in this weather, even at close range. It's evening before we get the gear back. No sleep for the crew before setting out again tonight. Maybe I think had 14 small ones, one swordfish. Diapers had 10 swordfish. It's a lot of gear to run for, you know, 15 or 20 small size tuna. But we have hauled out for a lot less. I try not to let it get me down. You'd like to be in about 10 different places at one time, but you can't. Last year there, we had one day, it was 150-odd uh, tuna, big eye and yellowfin mix, then 40-odd uh, uh, swordfish. We had, uh, we had them all, geez, the deck was, that was covered, all this wooded area, all up through here, all the bench, 
It's all, all covered in tuna. Jeez, what a, it was some nice sight. Almost done. Almost done, almost got the gear out. This tuna is only small, so it won't be worth much. The swordfish are only small, it won't be worth much, so. You gotta get an 80, probably an 80 to 100 pound swordfish. Make any money. Yay, 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 yay. I don't know what it is. Change the gloves or what? The salt water gets in and makes them right tender and just burns. Ain't the best looking things. They're good for scratching the waist back though. They're rough. She likes that. For fishermen, the curse of cold water is the blue shark. We're getting lots of them, and they're not worth a penny. Oh yeah, fuck, I think that's just a scratch. Yeah, it's all right. Fuck you, man, John. I live through it. <laughs> I got bigger scars than that on my cock. <laughs> what happened? Well, I just dressed the shark there and got my hand too close to his mouth when he shook his head, just come down across my hand. I'm just glad it wasn't a Mako shark. It was a blue dog that bit me. I'm just glad that it wasn't a Mako because their teeth are right long and jagged, where uh, blue dogs are just right short and stumpy. Would have been a Mako shark, it probably would have been a lot worse. Walked past the shark, and the shark up and grabbed him right there by the hand. He had to cut his jaws to get a clear. Man, it ripped his fingers just right out the end. Their teeth come back in as soon as they bite, and they rip. There's no, <laughs> no getting away from it. Just jumped right up off the deck and grabbed him. It's lucky he never lost his hand. As the days pass, the pattern becomes clear. Calm mornings, rough afternoons, not much fish, lots of empty hooks. There could be lots of fish where we're fishing, just not taking the hooks, maybe. Searching for something that's not here, maybe, I don't know. We'll find them, we'll go down to Easter for them. We're down this far. Another couple hundred mile won't hurt. <laughs> A nice little tuna. They're so fussy with these tuna, it's unbelievable. You gotta keep them, treat them just like babies. A little babies. This time here it's just a guess me. You don't know that, we could have come out and picked up 20 fish a day. And maybe if we get in the right place yet, we might get 20 fish a day. I don't know. <laughs> Why don't you guys take the wheel and I'll go back and haul the gear. Huh. See if you fellas can do any, any better. Has anybody get it back sometime today? What's that supposed to mean? That I can't haul that gear a bit as fast as you are faster? I've forgotten why we're taking snaps. You, know. you, can't, you can't call my snaps. <laughs> I'm telling you. This is our fourth set here. 
should have been in our fifth set, but we didn't set today because we got the gear back yesterday afternoon. We decided to go uh, east looking for water. I think we steamed 70 odd mile last night till about 11 o'clock. Never hit no warm water. The water is too cold, so we're working our way back to the western. We're determined, I'm determined to stay out till we get a trip. We could get like 12, 15,000 pounds early to get a half decent price for them. Would be a trip, but we got a long way to go. Happy birthday. I forgot all about it yesterday when I was talking to you. All right, I'll see you when I get in. Okay, love you. Emily there, she's only five and like I'll go home and she says stuff and does stuff that you wouldn't think would even come out of a five-year-old's mouth, like some of the words she says and stuff like that. That's the worst part about this job is, is that you don't get to see nothing like it. One trip you're gone out, you're not walking, you come in and they're walking. It's like, now nah, she'll go to school in September and I'll probably miss that, like, the first day of school. That's how it goes, I guess. Our luck doesn't improve. Hard work, hard weather. The crew going further in the hole every day. Say things don't look great rosy right now, do they? No, fuck no. I'm right disgusted with it myself. Oh, these kids are disgusted. Huh. Just getting started. <laughs> A month ago. No, no. It's only been 13 days now since we left. That's not too bad. We're not going for a good time. We're going for a long time. Ain't much to it, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, we're just going to keep going to the southern, I guess, till we hit water. Keep going to the southern, should hit something, should hit some warm water somewhere. The flat temperature all afternoon, 51, 52. That's a slice. <laughs> That'd be a sight to have, you know, you know. <laughs> you should have stayed home and have been a carpenter or electrician or something like that. This is experimental going out where no man has gone before. Right, Jack. That was some nice hand though, wasn't it? He was getting down low, so I figured I'd come down and let him win a few games. Ah, that's a laugh. <laughs> I love beating the bastard, too. All right. That's it. I just love it. Tell you the truth, I was depressed all the whole way down here. I couldn't win a game. Jeez. After winning them three games of crib, slam bang, we're getting fish tomorrow. I'll tell you right now. Well, I'm in a state of shock, and dismay, and disgust. I just managed to break camera number two. I wasn't paying attention. The boat took a sudden roll camera flipped off a bench, hit the floor, and the lens snapped off. The sound still works, but there's no picture. I'm feeling pretty low, pretty disgusted, pretty disgusted. Tuna! Rindo! <laughs> he got right there. I oh, see him there splashing, look! So Wes finally does hit the jackpot. And all I can do is take snapshots. Everyone's happy, but me. I rent a camera in St. John's, Newfoundland, 
where we land after 19 days at sea. John, you missed it. You screwed up. You broke your camera. <laughs> Just at the wrong time when we struck the fish. What a good day we had. Two good days fishing, really. To end the trip off, so we're, we paid our expenses. The final tally is 30,000 pounds, worth over $100,000. That's way better than covering expenses. So Wes proves he can catch tuna in May. That's the real thrill for him. He says to me, I don't like hearing the news. I like to go out there and make it. I join Peter Campbell and a load of swordfish off the seven girls headed for Boston. He tells me that with fish, timing is everything. We would have been there at 5 a.m. this morning, their time, but now we're going to be about 9 o'clock. There's a little bit of fish left over from the other trucks. They're trying, they want to move that first. And if the truck gets in here early this morning, then all the buyers are going to say, hey, you know, I want the new stuff. The old stuff isn't going to get sold, and, and the, uh, the other trips are going to have a lower price. Not always is it good to be in there early. Boston is the seafood distribution center in the east. Fresh fish arrives here from around the world, and the big problem is keeping it fresh. As a broker said to me, it ain't like wine. It don't get better with age. Charlie de Pisa is at work by 4 a.m. For a fish broker, every day is a race against the clock. We have to sell the fish for the highest possible price, but we also have to make sure that we do sell the fish. We want to make sure by Friday we are out of, you know, 90 to 95 percent of that fish has gone out of our store. The 93 and the 90 right there. And there's a 93 in the corner. Now the next one. Don't damage the fish. I'm looking for size. Certain size. I get customers that like between 80s and 100s. We arrive on Thursday with prime fish. An easy sell. Now it's Friday. The weekend looming. All of a sudden, it's much more a buyer's market. Mike, how you doing? Good, fancy sword over here today. East Coast all of it. A few large haddock. Dick Jones still has 5,000 uh, pounds off the seven girls to sell. Uh, hey, give me the extra quarter on the big ones. Try to. What do you mean, no? No is not the right answer. What makes us earn our money is selling fish to people who don't want it. To sell 20,000 a sword when there's 300,000 in the city and get a reasonable price for it. That's what takes the time and experience in the business. We'll reweigh them and pass the 75 and 50. How's that? You'll get the bonus, we'll wash them and everything. Uh, a little rinse, a reweigh, a little bit of ice. And we'll get them out of here. Everything? Everything. All right. The vagaries of the marketplace are one thing. Fishery science and regulations are another. 33% by number of the swordfish catch, catch, everything caught, was discarded. And uh, so I calculated the percent small fish as the number of fish discarded dead. What's the Department of Fisheries going to do to you next? I mean, you just get into one fishery, and if you do real good at it, they're going to say, no, you're doing too good. No, you can't do that no more. That's, that's the scenario that we always get. One time you went out and uh, you got a good trip of fish, you'd be really proud of it, right? You'd say, uh, geez, I got a nice trip. But now you go out, you get a real nice trip, and people's looking at you and say, what you catch them for? You know, you're catching up all the fish. It's mid-August. I'm in Fermuse, Newfoundland. The seven girls lands here because it's closer to the fishing grounds. Two of Marty's sons also come aboard. Right now I got Billy here helping me out. The other guy, I don't know where he's at. He's probably aggravating somebody. This is the last trip before school starts. Gotta go make a man out of him, John. 
Can't let him wimp off. Eddie summer vacation. Gotta start him out young. Another crew rotation, so I see some new faces. Todd Gray, and to his left, Wes's son, Casey. Donald Gilkey is beside Marty's older son, Brett. He's 12, and already acts like one of the crew. Marty's younger son, Billy, is 10. It's his first time out on a long fishing trip. I don't know when I'll be back again. Yeah. Next evening, we're on the tail of the Grand Banks, one of the best sword fishing grounds in the Northwest Atlantic during late summer. Billy is suffering his first bout of seasickness. The stink of diesel and fish together makes the nausea seem even worse. If Brett's feeling seasick, he certainly doesn't show it. I mean, I didn't want to grow up. I didn't want to get into nothing like this. I didn't know what it was all about until I started doing it. And I hated it. I'll admit it when I first started. I got seasick. But when you get seasick, everybody hates it. Oh, I ain't going no more. I mean, I seen my own kids, Billy. I'm never going again, blah, blah. But if you get it in your blood, you're making a couple dollars. You get in on land four or five days, you're a kid. Well, that wasn't so bad. I could do it again. You almost died out there, right? Throwing, uh, 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 getting sick. Yeah, I'm never doing it again. But there you come back. All right, this here, John, this is the big picture zoomed out. This is a satellite picture of the water. Right here is where we're fishing. Here is this northwest corner right here, as you can see. We're up in here right now. And the dark blue patches are cold, 62, 60. Light green is the warm patches of water, 67 degrees, right? We like the corners of the water. You can see on the, you see here on the water here, right? Yeah. Where I got these big turns here, that's the sharp corners of the water where the water changes. Like you'll drop it like a degree or two degrees. A sharp corner, that's what usually all the bait collects around. Sharp corners, you see a lot of scope on the sander. That's bait line, scope. You see that on the sander, that looks really good, right? That's where the old swordfish hang out in the bait. He's, he's missing all the action here. Really, get up and see the action. I think he missed his mummy, John. Can you look around and see if you can find anything out? Like, uh, get someone to call, uh, I've been already trying there. Yeah, well, it's pretty hard to find something out when I only found out five minutes ago. No good, that's for friggin' sure. That's shit happening. It's the last thing you want to hear out here. Captain of the all of us this trip there, Greg there, my buddy. His girlfriend was in a, a car accident yesterday. She flipped the car. Not knowing's the worst, right? If you know about anything like that, not knowing drives up the wall. Something coming there! <laughs> We're in to him. Don't tell nobody. Quick, be quiet. Woo! Keep your mouth shut. Stop being a wimp. Get up and move around. If your brother Brett can do it, you can do it. Stop being a wimp.
We've been looking for our gear here. We can't find it here. Big ship cut us off our gear all in cold water. Right in the ship's uh, lane we are here. That there is a great big pile of rain. It's all around us, right in the center of it. Here's the only thing you get going for you is your beeper buoys. We're not that far from it here now. He showed a Billy doing what he does best. What a pretty little boy. We gotta work as a team here, pal. Man, oh man, you can't be ganging up on your father like that. Use some of that energy back there on the deck. back on something there anyway, John. You're working quick because you got 40 mile of gear in the water and you got to get it back as quick as you can. I can say all the guys that fished with us, or even one of them, can say they never had an injury. I mean, Gumpy had his teeth knocked out, Buck hit him in the mouth, and Mark, he had his ear tore off. Billy, snood line hit him in the eye, crushed that. Now Harvey there, he started taking clips up the rail and he got a thumb tore off, the muscle on top of his thumb. You have to be thinking, your mind has to be focused the whole time on what you're doing. Taking clips, especially up the rail is the most dangerous joke. The gear's coming at you. Peeled here, look for floaters as Brett's up there trying to beat me. And his eyes are that big. I mean, he can see them a mile away. And I got one advantage on Brett. He don't look all the time. And see, I'm looking all the time. My eyes ain't as good, but I'm looking all the time. So. And I think, I think I see a, uh, Brett, what is it up there, buddy? I see it. I see you it. didn't see it? You didn't see a word. You see him? Yeah. Nice floater up by the buoy. I have seen you. It's my oh. fish. It's oh. my friggin' fish. You get back in the stern, Popeye. Oh, he's like saucers. He still can't look and see his old man. Take him easy now. I've never Down seen a fish off. this big. Yeah. It looks yeah. immense. Here, Casey, come over here. Ready? <sighs> Ready, set. Get that fin! Grab the fin! Uh. Huh? I gotta get the slack here, don't worry! One, two, three! Cut it, cut it! Get your gas out of the fin! Game too much or something! No, the fins are! The fins are! The fins are! Ready? One, go! Three. Come for fun now. Next one is that we're gonna win. Next one that big. Cut it off. Don't come, biggest first.
There. Better or nothing, day's work. What did we get? 2,000 pounds, 2,100. I guess the best way to explain that I got into fishing was big enough to go down on the boats. So all I did was hang around boats. My two brothers were on uh, the Bonnie Lou 2. The Bonnie, two Lou, Bonnie Lou 2 was lost at sea in 88. I lost my brothers when I was only 15 years old. And then I, uh, my mother and father wouldn't let me near a boat. One night I was over to a dance. A man my mother and father used to take camping when he was a young father. He uh, asked me if I wanted to go for a trip. And he said, uh, he couldn't tell me definitely for sure until he asked my parents. Next day I was still in bed. Here he was on the doorstep asking my parents if it was all right if I went fishing with him. So he didn't want to take me unless he had their permission. It's like my mother and father, they didn't want me to just go fishing with anybody, jump on any boat. Now it's brought up to look that way. Especially when you lose two brothers, you pay attention to what boat you're getting on. I say we'll get 45. Well, we don't load up tomorrow, then we don't load up tomorrow. Well, something's going on tomorrow. Well, we'll load up tomorrow. Each man takes an hour's watch at night. He makes sure the boat stays close to the gear. First night we tried 60 to 61, we got a little day's work. Yesterday we tried 62 and a half to 64, we got a good day's work. And we're a little shade warm rigging today, like 63 and a half, 64 and a half. You gotta feel it out, you gotta keep setting around until you find them. Boy, if this is sword, which I'm going to be so happy. <laughs> I think it's alive. Of course it's gonna give us a battle if it is one. Right away. Okay. Holy Frank! It's off! It's off! 
A big one. Yeah, get the gas over there for you. Good doing, Skipper, you know, like this, this uh, big day here today, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Gotta go get him. I think we got something big coming here, boys. Something really big. Oh, I see the boy up there just about going right under, I'm telling you. Like this. Like this. Get a hook in the air. Here's the front. Get the front. Come out of him. Get him, get him. Get the pole. We just got 20 fish off the last four sections. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. That's, that's a great. That's awesome. Oh. If I trust some swordfish, you can't be scared to get dirty. <laughs>
71 swordfish on our final day and my camera still in one piece. A perfect ending, at last. Everyone has good reason to be full of cheer as Christmas rolls round once again. The seven girls caught about two million dollars worth of fish, her biggest year ever. A full crew share could be up to eighty thousand dollars. A skipper's share could be half again as much. Even the brokers are here to celebrate. You want to get all parts of me out of this movie, yeah? This was also the year a new generation was initiated into the family business. I think that's what makes Louie truly happy. A few days after Christmas, the seven girls will be off again. The first halibut trip of the new season. Another year begins in the life of this deep sea longliner. 